Well, hello again, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the continuation of our sort of random selection of shows that we are doing in August, except for next week when we have Airborne Week. So today, and this is kind of a last minute scheduled show because of various changes. Kate Jameson, who's going to be talking about Royal Naval traditions and customs, will still be coming back at some point, but I don't know when that will be. But today we are talking about the Supermarine Sea Fire. Yes, you heard me right, Sea Fire. I'm sure a lot of you watching the well, you'd have to be blind to have not noticed the Spitfire over the last 70 years. It's it's just an iconic image of not just World War II, but Brit the British spirit, if you like. But it's fleet air um, cousin, brother, little brother, bigger brother. I don't know how you describe it. I'll ask my guest how he would describe it. it tends to get forgotten. So we have someone to talk about today. He was a former uh, director of the Fleet Air Arm Muse uh, Museum in the UK. He's written about and lectured on all sorts of aspects of fleet air arm history and indeed naval history. So I'm delighted to have him on screen with us joining us today. So Graham Motram, good afternoon, sir. How are you doing? Good afternoon. I'm doing absolutely fine. Thanks for having me. So uh, you just heard my little present, my little preamble there. I mean, where, just with regards to the Spitfire, is the Seafire bigger brother, little brother, cousin, uh, <laughs> nephew? <laughs> How would you describe yeah, it? I, I suppose all Spitfire uh, aficionados would probably say the Seafire is, is descended um may, maybe half brother maybe half, half brother. brother okay but yeah. you know yeah. it, it it is competing with an icon and that that's that's interesting because there's so many books about the spitfire and the spitfire now has got caught up as i said in that preamble there with mythology and representations of what it is to be english and churchill and bulldog spirit and just that constant churning out of of, of material about the spitfire and the sea fire doesn't quite get the same acclaim so in your case what what where where did your interest in the sea fire particularly originate uh it was actually because somebody asked me to talk about it um royal aeronautical society um had a symposium about spitfires a and three four years ago and asked me to talk about the sea fire um it's you're right. It's it's not the same uh, iconic uh, object, but it's the same iconic shape, yeah. uh, and it had much of the same uh, iconic structure and design around it. Although subsequently it was modified, um, but only what two and a half thousand sea fires were made out of the total of. 25 26 000 spitfire variants of all types over all, all periods and of course if you start with the spitfire one in 1938 i think manufacture started and didn't finish until we got to the spitfire 24 in about 1948 that's right yep. length of time and a, and a large number of aircraft that were built so, yeah, and as we'll find out, the, the, the thing about the Spitfire, and we will turn to Sea Fire very shortly, is the Spitfire became good at a lot of things and excellent at a few things, uh, whereas the Sea Fire, I think it's fair to say, took a bit of time to get good at one thing and, and, and perhaps didn't quite ever really, really come into to providing a solution for the fleet air arm for, for carry operation. But I, I'll let you talk about that as we go through it. But... Um, you know, you, you may think differently to me, but, you know, when we think of, I think of the uh, the Pacific campaign, and I think, of, for example, the American Corsair um, or, or the Hellcat, that they seem to me very, very suitable for what they were doing. And the sea fire, as glamorous as the shape was, perhaps, as we will find out, wasn't entirely suitable. But that, of course, goes into the needs of the two nations and what they were expecting their carriers to do and what they're expecting their aircraft to do. But we'll, we will talk about that. And as usual, folks, Please feel free to jump in with questions about either the fleet air arm or carrier ops, or of course, particularly the sea fire. But as usual, Graham has provided a PowerPoint presentation. Um, there is, I should point out, folks, there are four links in the description below to some clips on YouTube you can watch of sea fires in operation carriers um, because they're Pathé and um, so to depress. I can't incorporate them in the program, but they're there for you to watch at your leisure about it, which will illustrate some of the points Graham is making about how they perform on deck, their problems, their issues. But so I invite you all to watch them later on. But right now we will kind of start hand over to Graham. And then as usual, I will jump in with my points for clarification and questions from you guys watching. So uh, over to you then, Graham. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, 
there's a you were you were touching in, in your intro about the American aircraft that were around as contemporaries of the Sea Fire, uh, and th there's a danger that you were actually going to take half the lecture with that. Um, but that said, uh, there is a generation of British naval aviators who maintain that the fleet air arm from the 1920s to in the 1940s uh, had to make do with poor conversions of RAF aircraft. That's not entirely true, uh, although there were some types that, that do meet that criticism. But uh, next slide. Um, two of the ugliest aircraft ever built, the Avro Bison and this one, the Blackburn Blackburn, so ugly they had to name it twice, <coughs> um, were actually specified by um, the Royal Navy so that the RAF can't take all the blame. Uh, the reality is that the fleet air arms suffered when um, most of the naval aviators from World War I uh, transferred to the Royal Air Force in, in April 1918 uh, and didn't return to what had been their, their mother service originally. So that aircraft procurement became uh, pretty much a hit and miss process because of a lack of dark blue aviation specialists uh, for many years. And it was actually pretty much the middle of the Second World War before that situation um, became uh, a lot better. And in fact, uh, although I wasn't going to touch on it uh, originally, um, it was the need to acquire really good carrier-borne aircraft um, and America's entry to the war uh, that brought aircraft like the Hellcat and the Corsair in. And in truth, um, they were better naval fighters than the Seafire was. Um, and this is interesting. Sorry to interrupt you there for a second. No, no. When we had Jamie Seidel on a few weeks ago talking about the carry operations out in the, in the Indian Ocean, and he was saying about the American fleet and the British fleet operating together. And, of course, they both had particular things they were quite good at and particular things that they weren't good at. But over the course of cooperation there in that theatre, they 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 essentially sort of swapped ideas and both became better at the other the, the the skill the other the other force had been better at and that's one of the the key things it's a key subject of world war ii tv we talk about the cooperation between the allies and the and i i think people focus too much on friction between some of the leaders and generals and don't focus on the positives of this this inspiring each other with their different designs and their different outlooks and their different doctrines as the war goes on and you know, we've already had some comments on the on the uh, the sidebar there about you know escort carrier roles and strike force carrier roles and and our nations having different um, views of those doctrines and different abilities of those doctrines. So it, it's it's not really fair, I think, for me to make the comparison between a type of aircraft on in one navy and a type of aircraft in another navy because you've got to compare the whole doctrine behind it. But either way, I'll, I, I will I will hand back to you. I just wanted to make that comment about the the sharing of ideas between those forces? I think there, there's there's a whole... No. There's certainly a discussion to be had about who had the, um, the best ideas, most dynamic ideas about the use of naval aviation, um, but also about um, who also had the best ideas for um, what aircraft were required and, and to do them, because... When you come down to the the, the, the bottom line, um, particularly, let's say, in the Second World War, if you're a carrier-born aviator, um, whether, you're, whether you're Japanese, whether you're American, whether you're British, what you really want to know is that that piece of tin with a whirly thing at the front on it that you're sitting in is going to get you to the, 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 the war zone get you through it whatever's being thrown at you and get you back in one piece and and you know grumman and the ironworks and and the corsair as well um were particularly good at doing that um the sea fire was in a number of ways um but in in the end getting back to to um my thread um the sea fire was a modified raf aircraft uh modified for seaborne use and for much of the time, it wasn't actually that good. And, and we've got to be quite honest about that. Uh, and the Royal Navy had been dominated by gunnery officers brought up on tales of Trafalgar and Jutland. 
and actually were totally unconvinced of the potential of naval aviation. They didn't perceive any great need for interceptor fighters because the ship's guns um, would provide adequate protection against air attack. It was convenient by about 1932 um, to ignore the exploits of the Mediterranean fleet, which had run out of ammunition in trying to shoot down a Queen Bee drone, which was a, a Tiger Moth uh, flown remotely. Um, they insisted on doing the exercise again a few days later with the aircraft and the 500,000 feet lower and finally succeeded in shooting it down. But you know, anti-aircraft gunnery in the Navy wasn't very good. And so it, it was caught out a lot in the early part of the war. And, and then the Sea Hurricane um, was, was brought into play. Uh, and that showed that the high performance monoplane could actually operate successfully from um, a carrier deck. And so it was logical that the Spitfire after the Sea Hurricane should be um, evaluated for carrier use. And absolutely on, on, on schedule, there is a um, photograph of uh, the, the prototype Spitfire, that's Seafire 1B. Um, it's actually a modified Spitfire, which is, um, in a sense, the answer to your question earlier on. Um, <clears throat> it's got a, a, an arrestor hook. You can't quite see that it's got um, catapult spools, which are a little bit further forward on the fuselage from the hook, which were there to uh, throw it off, off the deck. Um, and these proved quite successful. Uh, and uh, 166 Seafire Mark 1Bs were converted from uh, Spitfire 5Bs. Um, some of them actually quite second-hand aircraft. Uh, but at least it was starting to get this iconic high-performance aircraft um, towards carrier decks. And, and sorry to interrupt you again, and is that the attraction, the high-performance? I mean, you're saying it was not ideally suited and it wasn't a conversion of an RAF, but it, it's high-performance. Was that really what drew, what the fleet air arm were looking for? Because, yeah. you know, yeah. we associate with the... And, and I'm I'm not one of those ones who agrees the Swordfish is a useless aircraft. The Swordfish is an amazing aircraft that does what it does very, very well. But the, the, the British had had some success with some perhaps slower moving, sturdier choices, but they hadn't really gone for this high performance, high speed. So that clearly is, I'm, I'm assuming, is, is the real attraction of, of the Spitfire. If you go back to 1939, let's say 1939, <clears throat> um, it wasn't just the swordfish that was um, a part of the fleet air arm. The fastest aircraft that the fleet air arm had at that time was actually uh, the Gloucester Sea Gladiator, a biplane fighter um, capable of about two, 280, 290 miles an hour. And alongside it um, was the Blackburn Skewer as a the first metal monoplane, um, general purpose may be, you know, the Navy was always short of money. Um, so the skewer, whilst it was an all metal monoplane, um, it had retractable undercarriage, which the Gladiator didn't. Uh, it had the ability to dive bomb actually quite well. Um, and in theory, it was also um, a fighter, but it was slower than the, the Gladiator. So by the time you get to 1941-42, we've put some Sea Hurricanes um, aboard uh, carriers, but the the Sea Hurricane, in fact, the Hurricane Spitfire gap was at that time something like 30, 40 miles an hour. Um, and so uh, the Hurricane was still only just capable of fighting in certain environments. And as we went to... Uh, originally to, to take on the axis in the Mediterranean um, and we're going to be coming up against uh, some um, ME109s and not to overlook, since we have an international audience, not to overlook some very, um, very attractive, very elegant, very capable Italian single-seat mm. fighters, um, then getting something like 
um, a naval line Spitfire on board uh, our carriers uh, was was a very important element of, of what needed to be done. Yeah, the the, the anti aircraft gunnery wasn't going to take out um, a whole squadron of of Heinkels or um, the specialised anti shipping load of, of Strukas. Something like Sea Hurricanes and then better uh, Sea Fires uh, were, were actually um, mid twentieth century protection for the ships. Um, which were having to catch up and, and overcome their gunnery admiral's obsession with, with shooting things down uh, from the decks of their ships. So, yeah, it, high performance was there. Um, the ability to, to, to um, put a lot of, uh, lot of metal on the target. You know, these are either um, an eight-gun or um, four-gun and two cannon or later on uh, four, four 20-millimeter cannon. Um, so you're getting both performance and hitting power, uh, which was significantly better than than people had been used to um, up to that time in, in 1942. <clears throat> and so after the, the 1B, um, there was another version, the Seafire 2C, which was based around the Spitfire's Sea Wing with its particular um, armament fit. It had its air, airframe strengthened to be able to be properly catapulted. And it also carried, well, I haven't got a photograph of it. Um, maybe I should have had a look. It also was able to carry RATOG bottles. That's R-A-T-O-G, rocket assisted takeoff gear. And if you could put your cursor somewhere around the wing roots below the fuse, below the cockpit, a bit higher, a bit higher up the fuselage, yeah, around there, you would put these, uh, whatever they were, about two foot long, two feet long, two thirds of a meter long, um, 20, 20 centimeters diameter. Yeah, probably something like that. Um, bottles of, of uh, very dodgy chemicals, which um, on a short carrier deck, you would ignite the bottles and that would um, blast you off under rocket power. They weren't that popular. They did work. The trouble was there was sometimes a tendency for one side to light up and the other side to remain uh, oh, well, determinedly yes, cold. And so you, you were taking off very fast with a huge amount of rudder um, and, and a very loud prayer in the hope that you know, you'd just get off the deck, get to flying speed, and then discard the, the, the bottles and, and go away. But they were very they, – they, they could in circumstances when – We'll see later on. Um, we'll see how full the decks could be. Uh, Raytog bottles could be quite useful when um, you were faced with a very short takeoff. Um, the uh, Seafire 2C had uh, a, a variant called the Mark L2C, which had its wingtips cropped um, and similarly its, its Merlin engine optimised for uh, comparatively low-level operations because most of the attacks on the fleet were between sort of ten and uh, 15,000 feet. Um, most of these things could also carry what was called a slipper tank, a 30-gallon slipper tank under the fuselage. If you put your cursor roughly under the undercarriage further forwards, between the undercarriage there, you could fit this slipper tank, which was shaped... Um, to the lower fuselage, but um, it, it was not um, really very popular, and I'll talk about its problems later on. I did see somebody coming along and saying, with that narrow undercarriage, um, they it must have been fun to land. And yes, the Spitfire was designed to operate off huge expanses of grass um, because it was originally a, an interceptor fighter to protect the homeland. Um, and when you start to put it um, on a carrier deck, the wheels are much too close together. Um, and one of its great failings was um, an undercarriage leg that was a bit like a carrot uh, and ready to snap uh, at, at not quite the slightest provocation, um, but it, it, it was um, difficult. Uh, a man called Alistair Fraser Harris, who retired as a Commodore from the Royal Canadian Navy um, later on, was actually the commanding officer of the first Seafire Squadron 
807, which was formed at Yeovilton in uh, June 1942. And Alistair said to me once that he took 12 perfect aircraft um, from RNES Yeovilton, and I lived just down the road from there. And he took them up to uh, Air in Scotland for carrier uh, deck landing training on board HMS Argus. And at the end of the first day, he only had five serviceable aircraft left. Wow. So the, the problem with the Seafire for most of its time was that um, the loss rate for landing accidents was something like five to six for every loss in combat. So it was an aircraft that had a high wastage rate, but not necessarily because of enemy action. Wow. Um, next slide. Right. Um, after Fraser Harris had trained um, his lot, 807, um, this squadron, 801, was the next lot to form up. Um, and they, uh, 801 and 807, embarked in the carrier Furious for Operation Torch, the Anglo American invasion of North Africa. Um, and there you can see um, a sea fire carrying American markings. That's because um, <clears throat> the British Navy um, was very, very um, unpopular now with the French Navy because of the attacks on the French fleet at um, Mers el Kabir under Iran in, in 1940. And so it was thought that the, um, the best way to try and get the French to cooperate um, when we try to um, invade North Africa and take it from the uh, the Germans and the Vichy French, uh, was to make them try and believe that everybody was was an American. Uh, not quite sure whether it worked. Um, the bearded, mustachioed gentleman towards the right hand side here, that's the CO um, at the time, known as um, Robert Hall, later known as as Sam McDonald Hall. He actually was one of my museum trustees in later years. Um, and was the oldest helicopter pilot in Britain when um, he was ironically killed in a crash of his private helicopter um, back in 1990. Um, during um, the uh, torch invasion, next slide, Paul, um, this man, George Baldwin, seen here as a captain, indeed captain of Royal Naval Air Station Yeovilton, um, was then a sub-lieutenant um, he was an escort for a strike of Ferry Albacores that was attacked by uh, Vichy French Duatine D520s and, and George shot one down for uh, the first aerial victory for um, the Seafire. The next slide has a name. This um, gentleman at that time was a sub-lieutenant. He is a man called Peter Twist. Um, in 1956, he took the first um, world air speed record at over a thousand miles an hour, uh, first four figure uh, <coughs> world air speed record. But at that time, Peter was um, a Seafire pilot and he was doing an armed reconnaissance um, and he got lost. He landed alongside a dirt road where there was American tank column. Um, asked where he was, asked for directions. Um, so he then took off, completed his tactical reconnaissance um, and returned to his carrier. He did eventually get um, a distinguished service cross for his time out there in, in North Africa. So you touched on earlier, um, you thought that certain aircraft did certain things very well. Um, the Seafire was actually doing pretty well at um, aerial fighting and tactical reconnaissance. Uh, because by this time it hadn't the, the basic Spitfire concept hadn't been butchered too much. Um, and when we get to the Seafire 3, which is the next slide, um, this is by now a proper naval aircraft. Um, the design work actually done by Westland because Supermarine um, had so much development work being done um, on the Spitfire that they, they said they didn't have the work to um, devise a folding wing. 
Um, if you take your cursor and point at that little dot behind the round on the on the fuselage, that's the catapult spool where mm -hmm. uh, the catapult was attached to fling the aircraft um, off the deck when they were there. Um, and also, if we look at the next slide, um, the C-53 now had folding wings, proper folding wings and a mixed um, 20 millimeter cannon and uh, 303 um, gun armament. I want you just to look at those um, jury struts that hold the wings in place when folded because um, we we'll, should see those in a photograph um, in a bit. Um, the, the creation of the folding wing sea fire meant now that not only could the big fleet carriers take um, some decent uh, fighter cover with it, but also the smaller escort carriers coming from America um, could accommodate uh, sea fires, an efficient fighter. Um, and uh, the Woolworth carriers did, uh, in some instances, um, host sea fires uh, squadrons or indeed composite squadrons. You mentioned swordfish earlier on. There were actually some composite squadrons of, of sea fires and swordfish, um, particularly in the Indian Ocean. Um, the first prototype Mark III flew in November 42, um, and production began in June 43. Again, like with the um, sea fire Mark L2C, there was an LF3 variant with um, clip wings, uh, and, and designed to be particularly a, a, a low-down uh, protection fighter. Um, that development of production allowed the number of sea fire squadrons to grow. Um, so during 1943, that, that got up to 12 sea fire squadrons, um, and they embarked in a mix of uh, both the big fleet and the escort carriers to provide air cover for. Uh, the invasion of Salerno in September 1943. And at times I have to put my sort of naval biased hat on. Um, it at, Salerno, at Torch and at Salerno, the ground forces were entirely dependent upon carrier air for their, their, their air support. The RAF, the USAF, couldn't get there so it was the Royal Navy and the US Navy <coughs> who put um, air cover over those those landings. And would you, and would say, you say Graham that, that, that is um, um, overlooked a little, a little bit? bit? Yep. Uh, you know, by yeah, by the, the average yeah. kind of ground warfare expert you know we we i mean i could certainly say when I, if i talk about those landings i don't particularly make a reference to the fleet air arm or the u.s navy's contribution um so that's interesting and the second one point i want to make is by this point with the with the folding wing are are the problems of landing and takeoff getting eased slightly or is it still the same problems broadly speaking it's the same problem um looking at this photograph <clears throat> You can see it's still got um, quite a narrow undercarriage. Uh, maybe I should have put a comparison photograph in of, say, the Sea Hurricane, where um, the Hurricane's land undercarriage was wider than um, the Sea Fire uh, and actually folded inwards, whereas it retracted outwards um, on the Sea Fire. It probably made it easier to fold the wing because we never managed to get a folding wing hurricane. Um, and I don't know whether any thought was ever given to it. But um, you can see here that um, the main structural elements, uh, cordwise structural elements of, of the sea fire wing, um, bridge the, the undercarriage um, aperture so that everything can fold in nicely and, and, and fold and unfold nicely. And uh, one thing I ought to say, um, particularly if we have any um, American viewers, um, is that the American manufacturers um, learned comparatively early on um, that trying to fold aircraft wings on a carrier deck under combat conditions and maybe with 
um, a typhoon blowing in the South China Sea was quite a difficult job. Um, and so they did put hydraulic folding on a number of types later on. Um, these were entirely manually folded. <clears throat> and so um, that undercarriage was a, a major problem. I touched on the loss rate being sort of five or six to one due to landing accidents um, or, or com to combat. Um, one of the problems that the fleet air arm suffered in terms of an own goal, if you like, was that very few admirals had any grasp of the details of naval aviation. Sometimes you can say that's not unusual and even today, but we don't want to get too dragged into that. But um, the man who was in command of um, the carrier task force at Salerno was um, Admiral Sir Philip Vian, um, and he didn't understand the concept of uh, wind over the deck. And he actually off operated the carriers um, very close into the shore. Um, reducing their ability to work up speed and making it more difficult for these aircraft to land on and con actually contributing to um, <clears throat> the, uh, the loss rate. One other interesting thing about Vion, um, which was um, a really morale building thing, was after commanding these carriers and sea fire squadrons at Salerno, um, he made it known that he thought the casualty rate had been too low. He didn't think that the Seafire uh, pilots had, had been aggressive enough uh, because they hadn't taken enough casualties. Fact was, they were bloody good aircraft and a lot of the pilots were pretty damn good. Um, but Vian thought you always must take, take heavy casualties if you're trying hard. So when he actually commanded uh, squadrons of, of, um, in the Pacific, um, some of the guys who'd served under him previously were really, really impressed to see him come back. Um, anyway, this is the C-5-3, um, and touching on some of their, their, their versatility, four squadrons of them were employed um, for naval gunfire spotting during D-Day, and maybe you didn't know that. I didn't know that. As a D-Day no. I didn't know that, no. Gut field no. guide. I've just told you something. You knew. Hands up. Yep, didn't know that. Yep. That's that's my Michael Caine moment. Not a lot of people know that. Thank you. You you right. can you can sleep well tonight, Graham. You've caught out a D-Day guide. I don't mind admitting I don't know something. That's and what's nice. more, um some of them were wearing uh the first workable um anti-G suit the Frank suit designed by a Canadian, um, they were actually quite comical in that they were rubber suits um, that were filled with pressurised water. So when the pilots uh, were, were walking outside um, the aircraft, you could hear them sloshing somewhat and walking with some difficulty. But actually it enabled them to pull a couple more G than they would otherwise uh, have been able to uh, in combat. And and not only that, when when trying to turn very tightly and, co and continuously um, over targets that they were spotting for um, the guns of the ships offshore. So um, sea fires used by uh, both the fleet air arm and I think there was one American squadron as well um, doing this gunfire spotting. Um, with the the war in Europe effectively secured by, by um, late 1944, um, the Navy then shifted its focus of attention uh, to the creation of the British Pacific Fleet to go back out and try and um, win back some of the territories which we'd lost to the Japanese in, in, in 1941 and 42. Uh, can we go to the next slide, Paul? Yeah, and, and just to jump in again here, would that be fair to say that that was going to be a bigger test? Because you were just saying if I'm, uh, a couple of minutes ago about the your average naval admiral not being quite as familiar and up to date with air tactics from a carrier 
and but with the Japanese, the Japanese, although by 1944 they are, I suppose, beginning to lose the war quite badly now, they they are probably, I would argue, the the, the greatest of the combined fleet, air, air power, air operations. And they, they're, they're masters of that from Pearl Harbor onwards. So it, this is a tough test now, isn't it? We're almost going off. We're almost going off piste. But okay. um, the the na the Japanese naval air arm in 1941 um, was the best equipped, the best trained, and because of the Japanese military philosophy of the time, um, the most professional and committed. To victory, absolutely no question about that. Um, whether you want to soften that because of their uh, 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 undoubted brutality in in, in certain areas, um, I don't think it, it, it is really a, a good argument. They they were very 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 good at the squadron um, and pilot level, and indeed, I mean Yamamoto. Hmm? brilliant strategist, um, knew what he was doing, knew what he was about, knew if they didn't win the war against America uh, by, what, the middle of 1942, that Japan would, would ultimately lose, and he was proven right. Um, but no, by the time we get the British Pacific Fleet um, moving out to the Far East, um, much of the really high quality um, Japanese naval air arm um, had gone. They'd lost a very significant number of carriers. Um, most of their early wartime fighter races and so on had, had um, been, been killed in combat. Uh, yeah, those dead, of course, as well. So, yeah, yeah, no, those dead. And yeah, the, the, um, the leadership is... is thinning out as well. Um, but that's not to say, um, as indeed I remember somebody, um, I can't remember now, it's a British or American fighter pilot in, in, in a forum saying um, the ME-109 um, by early 1945 uh, was past its best, but you still didn't want one of those on your tail at 35,000 feet over Berlin because it was a very, very hard opponent to beat in those circumstances. And that's true of a moderately experienced Japanese fighter pilot yeah. um, over the Pacific in, in, in early 44, 40, in early... And, and, and 40, as we know, they're getting more desperate. But the Japanese, and, and, we, we, as you say, we're in danger of going down a rabbit hole. But yeah, the, 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 the caged animal metaphor is kind of coming into play a bit by this point as well and you know ne never underestimate an enemy when it's when it they're on their last uh, and but I'll, I'll i'll hand back to you and this is this is a, of the photos you supply this is my favorite one i don't know why i like this one okay um we've, we've rambled why did i put this photograph in um the other challenge that i managed to avoid in that discussion reintroducing um was that that the Spitfire was designed as a short-range interceptor to protect Britain, effectively. In naval use, um, it was very short of legs. And that's why, in fact, it, for, for in, in the ferry role for, for the RAF, um, this slipper tank that fitted under the centre section um, was, was important because it didn't have the range. The trouble with the slipper tank was um, it had been designed to be a very close fit underneath the fuselage, and uh, it was very difficult to make the, the fuel joints. And you couldn't see when the, the tank was installed, you couldn't see if it was actually drawing fuel. And there were many instances um, of the tank not drawing uh, the fuel pumps burning out and the aircraft being lost. So in the Pacific, this was a very real problem because the distances to be flown uh, were, were much greater than, than, in essence, they had been in Europe. And so somebody uh, who didn't have faith in the slipper tank 
um, but was a member of 880 Squadron um, who had faith in the power of crates of whiskey to the American forces, um, found out that there were um, there's a large batch of tanks for Curtis P-40s stuck um, in New Guinea because they no longer had P-40s out there. And so um, a few crates of whiskey changed hands and dozens of these um, pear drop tanks, teardrop tanks, um, were acquired for um, HMS Implacable particularly. The squadron engineers worked out their own way of attaching this tank and a way in which they could check that um, the fuel was being sucked up and would be usable and the, the fuel pump wouldn't burn out. And this was actually very, very important to making the Sea Fire um, a, not only a uh, combat air patrol, a good cap fighter in the Pacific and able to stay up for a long time, um, but also then to start escorting strikes. And indeed, um, they could, fitted with that tank, <coughs> roam over mainland Japan by the end of the war. Wow. Next slide. Can't remember. Right. So so we, we go out to um, the Far East um, with sea fires versus zeros or Zeeks. Uh, here's the L the Sea Fire Mark II C against the the, the Zeke 52, um, and these were evaluated at Pax River uh, in in um, America before they went. And you can actually see that the Sea Fire was better in most things than the Zero. Now a lot of things affect who can win in a combat not least of which um, the tactical leadership. Um, but if you've got um, good performance uh, at any height, uh, then you can, um, you've got a chance of not only surviving, but of taking the other guy down. So here you can see the Zeke could still turn inside the sea fire at all altitudes and turns better to the left than to the right. They both rolled okay, but then, um, the zero stick forces increase considerably and the sea fire starts to become superior. Stick If you've got a Zeke on your tail, stick the nose of the sea fire down. It will, um, it will pull away and the guy behind you is going to be feeling his, his, his false teeth rattling um, with, with uh, the vibration. But even then, don't dogfight with a zero at this stage of the war. They've improved the zero. It's got heavier. The sea fire is heavier than a Spitfire uh, would have been in, in, in that way because of the naval equipment. But always respect your enemy. And therefore, um, the Zeke and the sea fire, the results of a combat between the two would very much depend upon the skills and the experiences and the commitments of the pilots involved. But you had a very good fighting chance out there if you were flying a sea far. So next one. Uh, and this is the um, only sea fire ace, Dickie Reynolds, um, who actually followed um, a zero kamikaze aircraft into his own ship's barrage and shot the, the, the zero down onto his, his own carrier's flight deck. He was a hell of a guy. Um, I met him, along with a few other guys of that generation, a couple of times. Um, and I think, you know, on the one hand, they were out to shoot down the opposition. In the other, on the other hand, they were out to out drink the opposition. And, and Dickie was vicious when, when the drink was around. Um, terrible man. On that subject, just briefly, Graham, what kind of people became sea fire pilots i mean was it did they choose it was it just luck of the draw i mean we we i think we have a mental image of the of the raf fighter pilot so the battle of britain but did the did, did this sort of aircraft and this type of the war draw a particular type of person from your experience 
I don't think there's any significant difference between the characters who joined the Royal Air Force uh, or who joined um, the Fleet Air Arm. Uh, the guys who joined the Fleet Air Arm got there actually by joining the Royal Navy and saying that they wanted to fly with the Navy. I've, I've actually asked that question of a few people of um, different generations, and they wanted to be sailors who flew rather than just aviators. And so... Um, but they wouldn't that, have known at that point, Graham, that after the war particularly, post-Battle of Britain, the, the stock, so to speak, of the RAF fighter pilot would rise and rise and rise. And you could get, go on the streets of you know, London, Cardiff, Edinburgh, Manchester today and talk to people about the heroes of World War II. And you'd get lots of people mentioned before you'd hear the fleet air arm pilots of seafires, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd, you would. You'd, and, you would. and that's that's unfortunate that their heroism and their 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 um their sacrifices has not been recognized in the same way of course that's not of course it's covered in the fleet air arm museum and the fleet air arm community but i mean to the wider world to the wider world uh and how how much are we dragging on the, oh the, it's fine keep on talking if you're happy i'm happy to talk yes, but I'm, I'm enjoying it the biggest problem is that um the royal air force created as it was and unpopular as it was in the 1920s um, became a hugely politicized organization and it has been very successful in maintaining that approach ever since we're digressing slightly um, and this is probably Finally. controversial, but I'm going to ask you if you know what the score is of aircraft shot down by um, Royal Air Force pilots versus Royal Naval pilots since the end of the Second World War, when we have spent billions and billions of pounds on strings of jet fighters of increasing speed, performance and complexity, call them fighters, but how many enemy aircraft have they actually shot down? Well, I'm going to assume, given given your background, that the answer is going to be, well, it's the Navy pilot, the pilots, and, uh, and, and it's a considerably higher figure. I mean, I'm thinking about my childhood of watching you know, the Falklands War and how important naval aviation was there compared to to, to other. So, yeah, I, I'm assuming that the figure is there. So, yeah, so t tell us what it is. Well, RAF-5, which actually were Spitfires, um, Israeli Spitfires, shot down around the Battle of Ramat David in 1947. Right. And something like 28 victories to fleet air arm pilots, um, variously in uh, in Korea, in Suez, and in the Falklands. Yeah. So, yeah. So, but so, but so that, that means these pilots then may not have felt, uh, received the gratitude personally or collectively, but the the Royal Naval, the Royal Navy received the benefits in terms of future developments of technology. The, the Navy, no, the Navy, the Navy fails itself because it grew up as the silent service, right? And to some extent, has remained that uh, ever since. Um, you know, the the relationship, and this is a, this is drifting off. But I mean, the relationship often between the media and the Royal Navy has has not been sometimes as strong as it might be, and I'm not sure which side it, it is, but you know. Nobody realizes that that you know, the Royal Navy today still has ships on the other side of the world. For instance, uh, on, on you know, what sometimes called the Caribbean Station, the Caribbean Guard Ship, working closely with with the American Navy and the Coast Guard and the Drug Enforcement Agency um, to stop drugs coming from Colombia onto the streets of of London, Bristol, Manchester. But they're there with a couple of Lynx or Wildcat helicopters, for instance, um, protecting Great Britain, but on the other side of the world, and you never hear about it. 
But shall yeah. we get back onto our thread? We should. Yes. No. I'm. I'm. I'm enjoying it, and people are definitely enjoying it, and viewing numbers are good. So yeah. No. Just keep on going. But yeah, we'll get back to the presentation. My apologies, viewers and Graham, for going down my 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 rabbit holes. Well, next time I do this, I will. I will get a rabbit head, and when we're okay. going down rabbit holes, I'll put the the the, the ears on. No problem. I won't go down a rabbit hole here because this is a very serious um, point I'm going to make. This man, um, Freddie Hockley, Sub Lieutenant Freddie Hockley, a Seafire pilot, um, he is the last Allied serviceman to lose his life in World War II. He was, on the early morning of August the 15th, he took off from Indefatigable um, as the escort of Seafires. For a strike of Avengers against Tokyo. Um, the formation was intercepted and although the escort shot down most of their attackers, Freddy's aircraft was damaged by flak and he bailed out. He was captured, interrogated, executed and cremated all on the day that Japan surrendered. Wow. And when you talk about men we forget about, men who have a right to be remembered, Freddie Hockley is one of those people. Well, thank you for sharing his story. And so that's the last Allied serviceman and who, who's lost his life in a particularly tragic fashion in a sea fire um, over, uh, over Tokyo. Okay, so so how good was this? Is yeah, leave that up. That's more appropriate for what I'm going to talk about. So um, I'm just going to go on now to to um, check my hypothesis uh, or, or invite people to test it. So, so how good was the Sea Fire as a naval fighter? And a lot of um, what we need to talk about actually it, it reflects upon the. Royal Air Force's view and requirements of um, its aircraft in the early 1930s. And one senior Farnborough aerodynamicist, a man called Sir Morian Morgan, um, said that, that in the late 1930s, there was too much attention paid to an aeroplane flying on a calm, sunny day and the harmonisation of controls for precision aerobatics rather than screaming downhill at maximum speed on the tail of an enemy fighter. And that comes back to your question of some time ago, Paul. And also at that time, manufacturing in Britain was still very much craftsman-based, with no real mass production culture. So precision and care were still the keystones of that culture. And R.J. Mitchell optimised the Spitfire Mark I as a land-based interceptor. But the wartime needs to increase its power, its endurance and its firepower immediately began to con compromise the original concept. And that's the concept of the Spitfire. Once they added the extra demands of operating from a carrier, then the, the actual aircraft shifted even further away from the optimum. So the Spitfire and I'm saying again, the Spitfire <clears throat> was a near perfect aircraft for only a short period of its existence. It started to get worse, relatively worse, uh, quite quickly. The Sea Fire got worse even quicker. Um, some people uh, outside the UK will have heard of Captain Winkle Brown, Captain Eric Brown. Um, Winkle's view on the sea fire was the view on the ground was poor because of the long nose. And that's true of every Spitfire. Its stability was marginal as needed of any good fighter. And its controls were very well harmonized, although the ailerons became heavy above 400 miles an hour. It had a superb turning circle and a docile stall, allowing maneuverability to be exploited to the full. And we're back here to how you design a fighter and, and, and you know, in the last 30, 40 years with the presence of onboard computers, we now design aircraft to be unstable and let the computer fly it. In those days, you still had to design an aircraft that was stable because a pilot had to be able to hang on to it, curse maybe, grit his teeth, 
um, haul back on the stick with both hands, but in those circumstances, he still had to be able to get the aircraft back under control. But going on from Winkle's point of view, its big shortcomings were in deck landing. <clears throat> the approach view was poor and speed control was difficult because the flaps weren't big enough and the sea fire was too clean aerodynamically. The landing gear had too high a rebound ratio and wasn't robust to withstand the high terminal velocity of deck landing. And the last one, the sea fire had the qualities of a submarine when ditched. So if you had to park the aircraft in the water, you could expect a very dark blue um, uh, cover outside your, your, your um, wow, wow. Uh, cockpit. And, and you know, as part of the developments, by the time of the Sea Fire 3, the centre of gravity had actually moved well aft and there was a need to keep the nose down. And they did that by adding three pounds of lead on a shaft welded to the, the base of the joystick. And even then, manufacturing tolerance has led to many aircraft having their centre of gravity even further back than expected. Canley Fowin were one company who built 80 Sea Fires with thicker skinning on the rear fuselage and uh, flush rivets. And that was an attempt to overcome the wrinkling of the rear fuselage after a heavy landing, because by now, with this, this um, C of G well back, as you're coming into land, it's very easy to thump the tail hard on the deck and to, to effectively bend um, the rear fuselage. Um, the aircraft also had a tendency and this is really worrying, to self-tighten in pulling out of dives or in steep turns. So even though you had your feet on the, on the instrument panel, even though you were hauling back with both hands on the control column, um, you could be faced with an aircraft that just wouldn't come out of, of the dive or the steep turn. So the beautiful early Spitfire had, had become a, a fudge of an aeroplane um, as a sea fire which was very demanding of excellent pilotage, and that wasn't always under, un, under in good supply under wartime conditions. Now, I was going to show some video clips, which as Paul uh, explained earlier on, um, we can't do because of um, uh, because of copyright. So, so we're just going to have a run through. That was a C Fire fifteen, uh, C Fire seven fifteen, last of um, the uh, <coughs> the wartime just about wartime ones um but but um these clips i think are m much more informative of of what i want to show this is hms implacable um it's after aircraft have come back from uh, a strike or a raid and here are the wings being folded they're not hydraulic wing folding mechanisms as i said earlier they're mandrolic and if you can stick your cursor behind the cockpit, sorry, ahead of the cockpit, Paul, keep going there. That is the jury strut that one guy on the wing has. That's it. One guy on the wing has to get in there and fit the strut with a, a, a pin at both ends to hold the folded wings in place. Bear in mind that this is being done behind the barrier. Um, which is there to stop aircraft um, bouncing uh, and into the deck part, which is at the forward end. It's a lovely, warm, dry day in the Far East. And actually, this was meant to be in the other order. It doesn't matter. Um, you can see also this is in the Pacific because if you look at the roundel markings on the rear fuselage, you'll see that there is no red. This is not a red, white and blue roundel. This is a white and blue roundel looking a bit like the American Navy uh, aircraft um, star and bars. Uh, and all red was banned from aircraft in the Pacific. If you saw an aircraft with a red disc on it, treat it as Japanese, shoot it down. And so we adopted this particular form of roundel for the British Pacific Fleet in the last sort of seven or eight months of the war. 
Uh, next slide. Here's the other element. Right? This is the strike before it goes. And, and um, it does contain quite a lot of visual cues, if we can look at it. Um, you, if you look carefully, you'll see the wake of the carrier. The aircraft carrier is turning into wind, ready to launch this strike of about 16 Seafires and, and over a dozen Avengers, which are at the after end of the deck. <clears throat> You'll see the plane guard destroyer following on. That job is to pick anybody out of the, uh, the water if their um, takeoff fails. If you look carefully under these sea fires, you'll see the 40 gallon, um, sorry, 90 gallon teardrop tank that we were looking at earlier. There we go. Thank you, Paul. You'll see that most of the aircraft are uh, already running up. Just as an illustration of the problems, if you look to the right, we've got one sea fire which clearly has been reluctant to start. There's four or five guys around there. They've still got the trolley accumulator, the trolley act as it's called. They're plugging in and trying to get it to start. Because, can we go back full screen, Paul? The line of aircraft here is about halfway along the carrier deck. So these aircraft at the front, have only got something like 350 feet of takeoff distance. So it's pedal to the metal, full supercharger, full throttle, and take off. And gradually, the guys at the further back um, have a slightly easier challenge of getting off. But then the Avengers at the back, being the heavier aircraft carrying bombs or whatever, um, have got something like a full 600 feet of, um, of takeoff. That's how bloody frightening naval aviation could be. You know, excuse me, I'm the lead Seafire pilot. I'm the squadron CO. I'm supposed to be showing everybody how, how easy it is, but I'm actually wetting myself at the thought of having to take off in 300, 350 feet. Mm -hmm. And everybody behind him has got similar squeaky bum problems. Um, so it's very... It, Coming back to your, your earlier question, Paul, about what's the difference between a fleet air arm pilot of these days and an RAF pilot, um, the answer is these guys would be prepared to take off in 300 feet rather than a few thousand feet of grass runway. And I think and the thing that I have thought of is just this the the delay effect of that, you know, that sea fire there that isn't starting, it, they may not get it started. So that has now put, put the whole... Um, take off in jeopardy now whereas on a grass airfield in Britain you know one Spitfire gets in the way you just work around it there's no it's not going to inhibit anybody else so they, I'd never thought about that issue of the the delay effect of one one aircraft having a problem yeah I mean they're looking at it you, you could probably launch aircraft one two and three on the left hand side of the picture <clears throat> then you could probably use that gap to taxi couple of the ones further back up, using the manpower on the wings to help the aircraft to turn. I mean, let, let's not overlook this fact that you know, there's a huge number of people on this deck <clears throat> with all of those propellers spinning, mm. lots going on, huge amounts of noise. No wonder that some people say a carrier flight deck of that era was the most dangerous place in the world. You had to have your wits about you every single moment. And in fact, I just noticed uh, if you go to aircraft number six on the left um, there, you'll see that there's a couple of guys still waiting down the tail as he does an engine run up. Oh, yeah. He's on the chocks, he's on the brakes, he's got blokes on the wingtips, he's got people leaning over the, the tailplane as he does an engine run up and a magneto check only a few feet from several other guys who could be chopped to pieces by those propellers. And that's why flying from carriers was immensely difficult and required immense skill and, and, and courage. <clears throat> so that's how you launch a, a strike in those days. Um, coming back, let's go that next one, Paul. Um, here is a, an, an illustration of the problems of landing a sea fire. Um, this is in 
uh, Southeast Asia, it's going to be Indian Ocean. It still only has a blue and white roundel. All the red's been taken out. And it has a blue and white tail code as well. Um, you can see um, he's missed uh, a wire, bounced. The undercarriage has tucked up underneath. And the propeller has smashed the, the deck uh, and two blades have broken off, which is one of the reasons why a lot of these propellers had wooden blades. It, it absorbed the impact and didn't shock load the engine as much as an aluminium blade would. And indeed, on these, this is a, an American built escort carrier. You can tell that by the wooden deck. Um, it didn't chew big holes in the carrier deck either. And, and we're back to this thing. Seafire has lost five or six in, in deck landing accidents because of poor undercarriage, <coughs> um, effectively, um, the drag and not enough drag uh, uh, to, to everyone in combat. Now, you can also see, just to take Winkle's point, how small the flaps are. Now, they're the things hanging off at the end of the wing. Cursor, Paul, come up to your left, up, up, up there, there, the rib, no, down, 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 down. The ribbed panel underneath 5X, those are the, that's the flaps. They were small. They didn't need to be very big to land on a grass airfield, um, but they were too small to land on a carrier. So they landed too quickly. And indeed, um, the same bunch of guys who came up with the idea of nicking the Curtis um, teardrop tanks in the Pacific came up with a way of um, increasing the flat setting for takeoff where um, they made dozens and dozens and dozens of little wooden wedges. And so when the aircraft had landed and they still had hydraulic power, um, they'd raise the, uh, drop the flaps, stick a couple of wedges in, close the flaps up. And as the gentleman, the great Dominion, just said, there were only two settings on the flaps all the way up or all the way down. Um, but you could get an intermediate takeoff setting by using wooden wedges. Get the takeoff out of the way, open the flaps, the wedges drop out, put the flaps up, you're back to normal, and, and, and you, you've enhanced your takeoff performance. Um, but all of this, of course, is, is um, it's a bit Heath Robinson way of making um, your high performance fighter um, as good as you want it to in, in the circumstances. So um, I think we've just about run running towards the end. I'll just go through these. Um, the uh, engine for most of the wartime Merlins uh, was actually, sorry, the engine for most of the wartime sea fires was the Rolls Royce Merlin. And the Rolls Royce Griffin came into use um, for, for the Seafire um, 17, um, which was like a Spitfire 14. But then they weren't uh, really very helpful. And small numbers of Seafire 45 and 46, um, but they didn't have folding wings. We ended up with this one, the Seafire 47, um, which has folding wings of a different design. The tips didn't fold anymore. Um, and uh, a contra-rotating six-blade propeller so that the aircraft didn't swing so badly on takeoff. Uh, 800 Squadron had a number of these. It, it, it took them to, uh, in 1949, and it took them to Korea, which was the last. And can we go to the next slide, if I remember rightly? Um, yeah, that's another version photograph of the 47. Next one, we took these C547s to Korea uh, and that was their um, last operational usage. Um, the, um, they were on HMS Triumph. They flew 360 sorties against the communists and completely um, wore the aircraft out. And one, un, unfortunately, one of the last things to happen to 800 out there was the CO was watching landings on the flight deck through um, a scuttle uh, <clears throat> from the, the below the island. Uh, and a firefly landing on, ironically, had an undercarriage failure, uh, broke its propeller, and the propeller blade flew through the scuttle and killed the CO of 800 squadron, oh, which was... Okay. 
not really the um, thing that we, we wanted to do. I think we'll knock it on the head there. That's that's the spiteful. Well, this one touch, because um, we, we're not going to use that other film clip, are we? No, no. Yeah, so let's just one. Yeah, so with this and, and one more, I think. This is, yeah, back back one. Paul, back to the last. That's that's the spiteful, um, which then had a, uh, sorry, this is a sea fang. The last attempt to build a Spitfire final version was called the spiteful, had a completely different wing. Look very much like this. This is a naval version called um, the Sea Fang. This didn't do very much, but um, its new uh, highly efficient wing was then mated to a um, jet powered fuselage. Next one to make the Supermarine Attacker um, the first jet powered. Uh, frontline fighter that the fleet air arm ever had. And you can see in, in, in building that new wing, they've now moved the undercarriage way out, the kind of thing that we should have had on the, the, the sea fire um, straight off. And what was the last slide, Paul? I've forgotten that. And there is an attacker being catapulted off because um, it didn't have enough grunt in the new jet engine to get off um, with, with, without catapult help. And I think that's the last no, no, that's, that, that summarises it. Just to yeah. say, um, following the attacker, a couple of generations later came a thing called the Supermarine Scimitar, um, which is the last single-engine fighter that Supermarine ever made. Um, the first fighter it ever made was this horrendous thing, a quadruplane, the Nighthawk, in 1916. And in truth, there's a lot less than one person's lifetime between those two photographs and the sea fire and it, its various ver spitfire and various versions of sea fire um, came between them and that's me done sir well brilliant and i just want to my my takeaways from this are that um our vision of the spitfire and therefore in turn the sea fire is you ask people on the street it's you know it's 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 poetry in motion it's perfection it's it's just the the, the most wonderful aircraft ever create, created and what you've informed us is actually it be, the sea fire becomes good at what it does or adequate at what it does because of improvisations the the, the wedges and the flaps there the extra weight added to the joystick and through the tenacity and brilliance of the pilots uh and it's the aircraft is part of the success but it's those improvements that make it and i think that's something that needs to be said because i think again we talked about this symbolism of the spitfire i think people think it's just absolutely perfect and as you said it started off performing a very good role very well but it, the more it got adapted it kind of lost vision a little bit and i think that what you've done is reminded us that it's it's the people behind it and the improvisation and the use of it that actually brings about the improvements and the um the, the the therefore the the, the success it can create you know without accepting it wasn't the most successful but it did what it did adequately because of these improvements yeah and i have to say if uh and probably shock other brits in the audience uh in my view the the best fighter of the second world war was actually the p51d mustang not spitfire I said that in a pub get together about a week ago. There was five of us here, and, and we did a cover top Trump's best tank. And I, I was one of two who said the P fifty one. So I feel validated with that now. Although yeah. my heart still tells me the Spitfire. My heart, because of just that, when I go to an air show, I don't very often. My heart flutters more when I see a Spitfire than it does when I see a Mustang, and that's something emotional. It's an emotional response, but my head tells me the Mustang probably did its job better. It was a beautiful, I mean, Spitfire was a beautiful airplane. Designed designed in peacetime by, um, I was going to say, yeah, probably Mitchell was close to a genius. Uh, I certainly wouldn't say that um, he was, uh, yeah, I, I certainly would not rubbish anything Mitchell did at all, um, other than to say he'd grown up in this craftsman culture that, meant that you made things that were beautiful and you hand-built them <clears throat> and 
in a sense, you hand fitted them. Now, you mm. talk to guys who built Spitfires and Mustangs uh, in recent years, and they'll tell you, damn nigh every panel on a Spitfire has to be hand finished. If you put a wing from one Spitfire onto another, um, there's always a danger that it won't quite fit because of the tolerances. Whereas if you've got a P51, if it's part number XYZ3 from that one in that corner and XYZ3 from the Mustang in that corner, the factory or the hangar, they're identical. They'll fit. It is what you need really in the field. You do not want to be getting a little hammer out and tapping in a repair. You want a big bit, big bit, put it on, aircraft back on the line. Uh, and the Spitfire um, didn't do that as far as I'm aware ever, whereas the P-51D did. Anyway, we've, we've gone down it several... It all comes down to production yeah. and the logistics and, and, the, and the, supplier, the supplier. As we've, we've talked about on previous shows, when we talk about Panthers and Shermans and things, it's the reliability, the, the ease of spare parts, the, rep, the repairing of all those things have to be considered when you're really playing that which is the best, which is the worst. Um, just one little thing I'll point, I, I'd like to, you, you, to, to bring you out. Pat says, what is Graham's thoughts on Winkle Brown's assessment of the sea fighters sixth in a list of six Navy fighters of World War II? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to say, well, I, I, I knew Winkle reasonably well. Um, he was he was never short of opinions that's for sure yeah, that's fair enough yeah um but i'm not sure what ne what winkle's other five are but um you mentioned corsair and hellcat earlier on without a doubt you yeah, know superb naval aircraft um in fact the corsair wouldn't have been superb if the brits hadn't taught the americans how to fly them but that's another story um, well, we kind of touched on that with that sharing of ideas and doctrine and technology as well. So, um, yeah, we're 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 in we're in we're in danger of going off down another rabbit hole that we won't get out yeah, of. So I'll show I, that. Think, I, I mean, no, yeah. that's my fault. I I I I I encourage that one there. But what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to remind people what we've got coming up in a minute in next week uh, this week, Graham. And I'm going to come back and say goodbye to you in a minute. So tomorrow, folks, we've got another aviation show. In fact, when Malcolm Kelly is coming off from Canada to talk about the air training. Uh, schemes in Canada, all the yellow perils, all those wonderful A6 Harvards and Tiger Moths and, and the training of so many Commonwealth pilots that, that received their training Canada. So that'll be interesting. Then we continue. Wednesday is Hollywood night. We've got shows about Lee Marvin, the actor, and also U.S. Marine fought on uh, Saipan. You'll know. We'll talk a little show about a new film that's being made about Audie Murphy. And of course, we've got uh, our Dieppe live special on Thursday and a show about Hedy Lamar, the Hollywood actress who had an involvement in the development of, well, you know the story yourself, but it eventually put the Bluetooth in our phones. That'd be a fantastic show. So as usual, folks, don't forget to check out what we're doing on Patreon. Consider following us on Twitter. Check out the clips that Graham and I mentioned in the description below where you can see Seafire through yourself landing on and taking off from uh, the decks of carriers. That'll be worth watching. But in the right now, it remains me very, to say thank you very much to Graham Mottram for joining us. Did you enjoy it? I, I enjoyed it. I hope your, your audience did. Oh, they definitely did. It's had good viewing figures. People enjoyed the sidebar conversation. And um, and I think we've converted a few people to who weren't fans of uh, of naval aviation to naval aviation fans. So that's always a good a good thing. So um, this is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying thank you very much for having the, your, you know, giving us your company this evening. And I will see you all again tomorrow. So thank you very much. See you again next time. Thank you.